Hey everyone, my name is Ben Farley. I'm the lead minister here at Redbrush Christian Church. First of all, I want to thank you so much for streaming our services online. So as we worship together, as we listen to the word taught together, our prayer is that this blesses you and draws you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. However, this resource is simply that. It is in no way meant to replace you belonging to a local group of believers. And so it's our prayer that you would be a part of a local church. And if you're in our area, we would love for you to check out what God is doing here at Redbreast Christian Church. Good morning, let's stand to our feet as we worship. Congratulations, you made it to church on time on the Jump Forward weekend. So uh, we're so thankful to have you here and uh, joining us this morning here at Red Brush. If this is your very first time, I want to say a special welcome to you. We're glad that you would choose to be here of all the places you could be uh, on a Sunday morning chose to be here at Red Brush, and that means so much to us, so we're thankful to have you here. I want to say a, a welcome to all of you joining us online and on Wabash TV. Glad to be worshiping with you from home this morning. Uh, we are excited for all the things that we've got planned this morning. Uh, 
we are going to continue on in our sermon series through uh, the book of Psalms, looking at all sorts of different Psalms because it, it really does speak to us uh, at every stage of life, which is why we've uh, placed the title on this series, In All Seasons. No matter what season we find ourselves in, uh, the Psalms have something that speak to us uh, in that moment in our life. So we're going to open up God's word together and, uh, and look at what the Psalms have to say. If you've never been here, uh, first off, I want to invite you to uh, text in the number on the screen. Let us know you're here and stop by the Welcome Center before you leave today so we can get a chance to introduce ourselves and thank you for being here. We have a small gift for you as well for being our guest today. Uh, but if you haven't been here, uh, here's what you can expect. We're going to sing a few more songs, and then after that, we'll have a time of communion where we pause to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. During that time, our communion is available at one of four stations in the room. There's two tables at the front of the room by the stage, two at the back of the room by the exit doors. Uh, during that time, you can go to whatever table uh, is comfortable for you, get uh, your communion elements for returning to your seat to have your own uh, few moments of communion uh, with Christ. And then, as I said, we're going to open up God's word. We do that each and every week because we believe that it's powerful and it speaks to us today. And so we're going to do that uh, as we worship God uh, in multiple different ways today. But in the meantime, let's continue to lift our voices and sing to God.
Corinthians 5, uh, 21, and it, Paul in that letter describes a relationship between the church and Christ as a marriage, as a, a bride and a groom, and the roles of a husband and wife to each other, and how wives are to submit to their husbands. And then I, you know, I thought about my own marriage and the only way I can get Ashley to submit is with an arm bar. So um, when, you, when you view it as what a perfect marriage should be versus you know, dealing with human personalities, um, faithfulness, love, um, devotion, and uh, you know, sacrifice, and Christ gave, as our groom, He gave everything for us on the cross, and that also reminded me of was you know when I told Ashley I would do anything for her, I meant I'd fight a grizzly bear, I would wrestle a shark, I'd take a bullet. I wasn't talking about folding laundry and vacuuming, so. Um, But I would easily sacrifice myself for her and the rest of my family to, to live on. And the only benefit we have is that as a human husband, if we sacrifice ourselves, we leave them. But Christ came back and he's coming back for to unite the entire church body in a in an anniversary, in a, in a reunion that we can't even imagine. So as we go into uh, to pray and then we take our communion, uh, let's, let's, think about, let's think about that relationship and how we can be better to each other and how we can be ready for whenever Christ does return. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and thank you for Thank you for sacrifice on the cross and thank you for the salvation that wrought us. And let us fill our hearts with, with love and thankfulness and seek to, be, seek to be that perfect bride for you as the church. In your name I pray, amen.
Well, good morning. I want to welcome you into Red Brush Christian Church. Um, before we get into this morning's message, um, we're, we're going to be in Psalm 13. If you want to go ahead and turn there this morning. Uh, we had quite a busy weekend for many uh, of us at, at Red Brush Christian Church. Um, over the weekend was the big overnighter at Oil Belt. Uh, 300 plus kids and our, our very own Step Forward kids led that. Um, a phenomenal weekend from everything I've heard, um, from the, the teaching to the crafts to the singing. Everything was done by those students. And so here's what I want to ask. I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, if you were one of those Step Forward students, would you stand up real quick? Uh, we want to honor you in that. The rest of them are very sleepy this morning. So, um, you know, if you've ever wondered, uh, can, I, can I give, can I serve, can I lead in some fashion, um, man, look, look, look to these students. Uh, if they can, you can. Uh, man, the church works best when, when we all take a cue from them and, and step forward. And so, man, thank you guys for what you do. Um, you make a kingdom difference. And, uh, man, I'm so proud of you guys. Week two of In All Seasons, as we look at different themes within the book of Psalms, uh, different circumstances that the psalmist speaks to as to how all of these still point us to God, how they point us to Christ. And so uh, the goal of this series is for us to look at the word and see that it is relevant regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what season you may tend to be in in life. The word speaks to that and the word points you to hope. And so Ron opened up week one with Psalm 1. And I know, I know what he said. I know he said that I said it was because he was old. All I told Ron was that he was wise. He took it and ran with it. All I said was, Ron, you've got wisdom. Why don't you lead Psalm 1? Ron took it as I was saying he was old. You know, I'll let you be the judge of that. But Psalm 1, uh, Ron did a fantastic job opening that up and reminding us that, that wisdom starts from knowing God. And, and the way that we know God is through his word. You want to be wise, you want to be blessed. These are the two things that, that Psalm 1 lays out. He says, the person that is wise, the person that is blessed, both have something in common. It's that they walk with the Lord. And on the flip side of that, the person who is unwise, the person who is ultimately cursed is the one who has rejected. There are two paths that Psalms lays out, and the deciding factor does not rest with them. The deciding factor is, are you following the God of the universe, or not. This is the dividing line between blessing and curse, wise and unwise, and so Ron did a fantastic job of setting the scene for that. So this morning, uh, we're going to open up to Psalm 13, and this is one of the Psalms written by David, and if you look at the life of David, uh, what you may recognize is that there is a realness, there is a rawness to David's story. You know, as Travis laid out, he would fight a bear for his family. Well, David actually did. Like, David has killed wild animals. This is a, this is a big time dude. And yet, what you see through his story is that, man, there are, there are emotions that are raw. There is an authenticity to David's story. We get to see him at his lowest points, we get to see him at his highest points throughout his story. And, and as we come to Psalm 13, what you're going to see is that we're, we're at a low point in David's life. Some scholars would suggest that this was the point where Saul is chasing after David and trying to, to kill him, to keep him from ascending to the throne. We don't actually know what's going on at this point in David's life, but what we recognize is that it's not good. David is at a low point in his life, and it doesn't really matter the instances because what matters is the conclusion that David is going to come to in Psalm 13, and I hope it's the conclusion that you and I will come to at the low points in our life too. So we're going to open up with verse 1. David writes this. He says, How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I want to stop here for just a moment because 
If you've been a believer in Christ for any length of time, this is a question that you've asked or spoken or at least lived out as well. These questions come. And if you say you haven't, then I can only come to two possible conclusions. One, you're not being honest, or two, you haven't experienced it yet. Like, it's going to come. There's going to be the questions where, yes, Lord, where are you? Lord, have you forgotten me? And so as you read, what often happens is we, we remove the emotion from it. We simply just read it at face value, and, and we miss the extraordinary emotion that is in play here. So David's not saying, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? No, he's saying, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And the low points of our lives tend to cause these questions to spring up. They may not look exactly the same as this, but they sound an awful lot like, God, where are you? God, don't you care? God, do you even love me? God, are you even good? God, are you even real? These are the questions that come to the mind of, quite honestly, believers and unbelievers alike. The low points in our lives tend to bring up these questions. And, and now, certainly, some of us stay in these low points longer than others, but these questions are there. The doubts, the questioning, they're, they're there. So David is at this point. These are the questions that are creeping to his mind. And the key to all of this this morning is as we look at the questions that David's asking, as you wrestle with the questions that you've asked in, in your heart, the key to all of this is what do you do or where do you go when those doubts and those questions creep in? Well, where do you go? There's a stigma within the Christian world that leaves many people with this sense of good Christians don't have any doubts or questions. Like a good Christian shouldn't ask these questions, so just keep them to yourself. The reality is, is David is a man who, who is told to us that is a man chasing after God's own heart, and yet he asks these questions, God, have you forgotten me? God, have you completely left me behind? Any relationship between the all-knowing, all-powerful, infinite God and his finite creation is going to involve some questions. So as we approach this issue this morning in Psalm 13, recognize this. You don't understand all of his ways. I don't understand all of his ways. These questions come. So we're not pushing back against those and buying into the lie that a good Christian should never question God, should never have these thoughts creep into their mind. No, we, we recognize they come, but we're not going to leave them there. We're not going to leave these unchecked. And in fact, what I would tell you is this. For a believer, the only bad doubts or the bad questions are the ones that are left unchecked. The ones that are simply taken at face value and said, Lord, I, I feel this way, so this must be true. Or God, it, it seems like this is what's happening, so I'm going to go with that. Oh, the only bad doubts, the only bad questions are the ones that we don't check, the ones that we don't go to the source of truth and compare what we perceive as to the absolute truth. The only bad doubts or questions are the ones that are left unchecked. This is not a new phenomenon. Psalm 13 is not the first time that these questions come in. They certainly won't be the last. If you've got your Bibles, jump over to Isaiah 49. This isn't going to be on your screen, but this is a moment in Israel's history of, of following God, of, of not really understanding exactly where, they're ta where he's taking them, that Israel asks these same questions. Now keep in mind, they're dealing with the exile to Babylon. They're dealing with the destruction of everything that they've ever known. And they're asking, God, I, I thought we were your blessed people. God, I thought you promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. God, where are you? In Isaiah 49, they ask these questions. But Zion, meaning the people of Israel, said, 
The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And in the middle of this question, of this feeling, of this thought, that Israel says, God, God, where are you? You've clearly forgotten me. God answers in verse 15. He says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she's born? In other words, he's saying, no, it's, it's not possible for me to forget you. And, he, and he's giving them this human example. He said, listen, look at the mothers around you. Can they forget their child? Can they, can they leave them behind? He's saying, listen, I know there's, there's some random circumstances, some, some very few circumstances where maybe that happens. But he says in verse 16, though she may forget, forget I will not forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. And your walls are ever before me. He reminds Israel, regardless of what the circumstances look like, I will not and cannot forget you. So to the believer, this is the same thing. As David asks these questions, God, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? The reminder throughout God's word from, from God himself is that I cannot forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. And the truth that we come to in this is that as we deal with doubts, as we deal with questions, as we deal with the valleys, the depths of life, What's important for you and I to remember is that momentary circumstances do not dictate eternal truths. Momentary circumstances do not dictate eternal truths. So David is asking the question, Lord, how long will you forget me? Because it seems like you've gone away from me. God's response to, to his children and to David and to us is, I will not forget you. God's care for those who have put their trust in him is constant. It's as constant as, as things that we know can relate to in this life like the sun. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. I, I've told you before that I, I love traveling and, and previously in, in uh careers before ministry, um, I had the opportunity to travel a lot. It means I was on airplanes a lot. And one of the coolest things is when you take off and you're ground level and you, you see just darkness. It's days like today. It's, it's cloudy. It's, it's dreary. And then as you ascend and you get above the clouds, it's bright. The sun's there. And this is, what, this is what all of this truth is trying to convey to us. Don't get caught up in how it appears in the moment. The, the, the love and the remembrance of God for his people is as constant as the sun. It's there regardless of whether you see it or feel it in the moment. It's not left. So don't miss this. I want you to notice the freedom that in verse one, David presents his questions and doubts to God. Because while at first glance, it, it may seem like a bad thing, what David is doing is he's expressing this intimate relationship between him and God. And here's what you need to understand as, as you deal with this as well. Because for us, uh, this is difficult. It, it's difficult for us to, to read this these doubts and these questions of David and say, man, I, I want that. No, there's something inside of us that, that it feels wrong. But what David is showing you is that him and God have an intimate relationship. And, and here's what I would tell you. There is no intimacy without authenticity. David is expressing, this is, this is exactly how I feel. This is exactly what it appears to me. And God, I, I, I gotta be honest, it feels like you're, you're distant. It feels like you're gone. And there is no intimacy without authenticity. And it continues this in verse two. 
It says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? <laughs> Listen, there's something in these first two verses that when we read them out loud and we, we think about the way we perceive things, they feel sacrilegious. You may read these first two verses and feel like, God, why, why are you, David, why are you talking to God this way? Don't you know who he is? Don't you know what he could do to you? Why? Why? Why would you question him? Why would you doubt? It doesn't really make sense to us in our culture, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. Because if there was one word I could use to describe every single one of us in this room and, and, and our culture as a whole, it would be this. Fine. You're fine. I'm fine. Right, in fact, it's, it's become not even uh, something that we ask. Now it's just become our standard greeting. I ask you, you ask me all the time, hey, how you doing? Fine, how are you? Like, we don't, it, it's just a part of our greeting. We don't even acknowledge the fact that our life is falling apart to you and I and to each other. We're fine. How you doing, man? I, I, I'm fine. Forget about the fact that my life is falling apart. I'm overwhelmed with stress. I fear that my wife is going to leave me. My kids don't respect me at all. Work is falling apart. I cannot pay the bills. <laughs> Fine. How are you? All right, this, is, this is our culture. You, you've got to tidy yourself up so that you appear like you've got it all together to your fellow man. And so there's something in us that doesn't reconcile what David is, is trying to express to God. Like, David, keep that to yourself. No, David is, is showing you the level of intimacy with God that's available to you and I. That as believers, who are we to think that God can handle our questions and our doubts? He's big enough. He's big enough to handle your doubts. He's big enough to handle your biggest questions. The question is this, is, is do you have an intimate enough relationship with him to express those? David does. But we bought into this idea that somehow God can't handle our honesty. See, there's an important shift that's getting ready to happen between verses two and three. David has spent the first two verses really wrestling with his emotions. God, it feels like this has happened. God, it feels like you're not present anymore. God, this is how the situation feels to me. And he's living in this clouded view of his perception. But here's the deal. As he expresses his, his doubts and his questions, there's this great sense of intimacy and honesty between him and God. But there's a key shift that happens between verses 2 and 3 that is key for you and I as we deal with these questions and doubts in our own lives. What you're going to notice is that David moves off of himself, and in verse 3 he's going to start to pray. This is why it's key for you and I. If we don't move to this point, then what will end up happening is that these thoughts and these emotions start to turn inward. And we just become a people who wallow in self-pity. God, it feels this way. You're distant. You've left me. You don't love me. And we sit and we continue this cycle. And so David is, is giving us the remedy to this because he's moving off of himself. He, he's, he's honest. He says, this is how I feel. This is what it looks like. And then in verse 3, he changes his view to look at God. And if you're a parent, you'll, you'll recognize what David is doing here, especially with little kids. Verse 3 says, look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. There are very few moments in my house during the day where one of two words is not being yelled. Mom, Dad, Mom, look, Dad, Dad, look, Dad, listen, Mom, look at me. They're doing the same thing that David's doing. David is saying, God, God, give me your attention. Listen to me. Look at me. But he's turning 
his perception off of, off of what I see now. And he's going to God in prayer. God, look at me and answer. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. There's an acknowledgement in this. God, I recognize that my circumstances seem dark. God, I recognize that everything around me feels like it's falling apart. So God, I need you to give me your light. There's recognition, God, you're the only one that's going to bring me out of this. Give me your attention. Give me your light. Verse 4, and my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. In verses 3 and 4, recognize what David is asking for. What you're not going to see is, God, just remove all of this. God, bring me to times in my life that are full of, of peace, of prosperity, of victory. No, he's not asking for that. What David is asking for is, God, give me more of you. God, give me more of your presence. Give me more of your peace. He's not asking to change his circumstances in the moment. He's saying, God, remind me that you're here. Remind me that you love me. I hear this a lot in our church and our, our church culture today. I just want more of God. I just want more. The reality is, is I don't think most of us do. Because the church culture that is, is being cultivated, and I don't just I don't mean here necessarily, I just mean the church culture at, at large is one of, of, to get more of God, then, then you need to feel this certain way in worship. To get more of God, you need to possess this certain spiritual gift and exercise that. To get more of God, you, you need all of these other things. And what David is saying is this. He's saying, if you want more of God, take an example from him. What are the two things that he seeks the first one that you're going to see in these two verses is that he seeks to go to God in prayer. You want more of God? Talk to him. Go to him. And then in verse 5 he's, and 6, he's going, to give us, he's going to give us the next place that you go. He says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. What is, he, what is he speaking of? Well, he's speaking of the biblical, the Old Testament truths that he knows. I, I know, in spite of circumstances, God, that this is who you are. So you want more of God? It starts with prayer and the word. That's not... There's not a magic pill that you can take to, to somehow get closer to God. It's, it's here. It's the truth of his word. It's going to him in prayer. Don't buy the lie that it's all this other garbage. I hear all the time, I just want God to speak to me. He has. In his word, he's spoken to you. Go to his word. Go to him in prayer. This is what you need. That's the conclusion that David comes to as well. I'm going to lay out my request. I'm going I'm to be honest with him. And I'm going to remind myself of the truths of who he is. Verse 5 again, but I trust in your unfailing love. That, that word, but, is a key in all of this. Because it means in spite of. And David has laid out, listen, this is, this is how things feel. This is what I see. This is my perception of, of everything that's going on. So God, listen to me. Give me your life. Hear my prayers. But 
we don't know how long it is between verses 4 and 5, but what we do understand is that David's circumstances haven't changed. David still perceives these things going on around him. He's still in the valley of his life, but he says, but, meaning in in spite of circumstances, I mean, in spite of my perception of life around me, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Meaning this, David has said, I'm gonna trust him in the dark. I'm gonna trust him when I can't see. I'm gonna trust him when I don't understand where he's taking me. I'm gonna trust him when it doesn't feel like he's even present. But I know, I know he's there. And so David moves to verse six and he says, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. His circumstances haven't changed. But he's gone back to remembering who God is. Remembering what he's done in his life. After all, God has saved David. And so even though it doesn't feel like it in the moment, even though it feels dark, I'm going to remind myself of who God is and what he's done. And I come to this conclusion Man, he's been good to me. He's been good to me. It reminds me of what the writer of Hebrews says in uh, Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Again, this won't be on the screen, but he's, he's getting ready to talk about these heroes of the faith. And he says, well, here's what faith is. It says in verse one, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Listen, I don't know what you're going through. I know at one point or another, everyone's gonna deal with suffering, everyone's gonna deal with darkness in their life, everyone's gonna feel like they're in the valley, and maybe that's some of you now. The question is, is are you going to trust him in the dark? Momentary circumstances don't dictate eternal truths. So so where do we go in those moments where it feels like the darkness is closing in? We're honest with God. This This is how I feel. This is what it feels like. This is where it feels like you are. We're going to shift the focus off of us. God, give me your light. God, bring me through this. God, be with me. Remind me who you are. And then we're going to remind ourselves who he is. And we're going to declare, because believers, no matter what circumstances you're going through now, you can all come to the same conclusion as David as believers saved by Christ out of our sin, you, you can come to this conclusion regardless of what's going on in life now as I think about the eternal perspective and recognize that the darkness will end either this side of eternity or the next because of Christ. I can say, he's been good to me. It brings us back to the truth of the gospel we recognize through the word that that there is nothing good in us. Definitely not as compared to a holy God. There is something broken in us. And as hard as you try, you're unable to fill the gap. And so if that's the end of the story, we are a people to be pitied. We're a people without hope. And if that's the case, then, then you might as well just live it up in this life because this is all we got. But the goodness of the gospel is this. The perfect one stepped in. The law demands perfection. Salvation demands perfection. Man, as I look at my life, I am far from it. 
when you take inventory of the things that you've done, you recognize how, how severe this gap between me and a holy God is. It leads us to the same conclusion that, that Paul says in Romans chapter 7. He says, who's going to save me from this body that's subject to sin and death? Who's going to save me? And the next words out of his mouth are praise be to God because he's given us his son. When you recognize the goodness of the gospel, you can declare even in the darkness the same conclusion as David comes to. I will sing the Lord's praise for he's been good to me. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, as I examine my own heart and I see who I am apart from you, God, it magnifies the greatness of the gospel message. But Lord, it does not keep us from the dark circumstances of this life. And so as David laments, Father, we, we thank you uh, that, that we can see through your word where to go, to be honest with you, to develop this intimacy with you uh, through our openness with you. God, we praise you that you hear us. But Father, I pray that our focus doesn't stay on our circumstances, that instead we seek to, to understand that our circumstances don't dictate who you are. They don't change your goodness. And so that we would put our eyes on you. And regardless of what we face in the moment, regardless of what it feels like, we can declare because you've saved us eternally, Lord, you have been good to me. So Father, we praise your name. Uh, you are worthy of it all. So, Father, as we sing your praises in a moment, I, I pray that we would do so as a people that are not dictated by circumstances but are led by the truth of who you are. That can declare with all that we have, regardless of what we're going through, you have been good to us. And we're going to declare that goodness back to you. Father, thank you for your son his broken body and his shed blood that is our hope. And we praise you for him. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand and praise him together.
Well, again, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that the worship was uplifting. It was encouraging. I pray that the teaching encouraged you to dive deeper into your relationship with Jesus Christ. If these resources are a blessing to you, would you consider partnering with Red Brush in giving towards the goal of furthering our ministry? You can do that by visiting our website at redbrushcc.org and click the Give tab in the corner. We seek to make Jesus Christ known, and your giving helps us do it exactly that.